All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Hi, and welcome to episode whatever. We're closing in on 500 episodes of the KISS FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Daniel, and with me I have Julian. Hello, Julian. Oh, I have to come off mute. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. And Lonnie. What's up? Ken. Hello. The voice of reason. And finally, Mark. Everybody's favorite member of the panel, from what I yeah. remember reading. Everybody's favorite. The YouTubers, so, you're popular on YouTube. Mark. Yes, I'm very popular on YouTube. <laughs> so, so, so to them, I, tell, I have a message for them later, but I'll be, I'll be nice now. Well, no, people least... are going back through the old uh, videos now, Mark, and finding where you said nice things about Destroyer and flagging it. Oh, okay, good, good. Uh, it's well, good to least... see that. It's good to see that my popularity is making them go back to prior episodes. We appreciate your comments and your views on Destroyer, but uh, lately it's been kind of rough. But uh, that's okay. We all love you, Mark. You know that. Hey, it's so. The USA. Uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Don't get that started right off the bat. <laughs> okay, um, today we're actually going to discuss what has influenced us when it comes to popular culture. And you know, popular culture out of America influences all of the world, especially here in Scandinavia. So I have a lot of influences from America, and uh, I guess you do do as well. So we're going to list five KISS influences that were really important to us. Uh, and also five other influences. You know, it, it could be any. It could be art, movies, other music, uh, and so on. So it'll be really interesting to hear what you guys have to say, and maybe we get to know you a little bit better. Um, do chime in on in the commentaries, and it will be interesting to see if there are any common denominators when it comes to Kiss fans, other than the Kiss fandom. Maybe we like the same stuff as well outside of Kiss. We'll see. But I think we'll start off with the Kiss influences. So uh, try to pick one of your Kiss influences, one of the most important. Uh, Don't you want to do the news? That happens to you. Yeah, maybe we should start with the news. News, because there is something that has happened that Ken is an expert on. I know he's been commenting on it on the KISS FAQ uh, message board. So, Ken, what about the news? Something has happened in the KISS world. Well, I'm not an expert, uh, per se. Robin but uh, The voice of reason. <laughs> no, well, you know, there's a... Uh... There's uh, we came up. Kiss filed a civil lawsuit um, against uh, Kurt Gooch, and there may be others involved. I don't know, um, but it has to do with uh, I believe the years of seventy, what seventy three to seventy seven, something like that. Um, recorded materials, uh, concert footage, that sort of stuff. Um, I know it mentioned some eight millimeter stuff and other things, but, uh, so something's finally being done about that because I, I think, you know, it's considered kisses ownership, um, uh, where someone else, the other party is saying they own the material, um, just because they found it or bought it from somebody else, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, that, that finally started up, um, so, you know, we have to wait and see what, what comes out of that. Um, there may be, you know, I, I'm assuming that they'll win this lawsuit or it'll get settled or, or something will happen. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about, too, regarding this is, is this any way tied into their, you know, their licensing or their, their deal that they were trying to do, uh, you know, as of a month ago? You know, selling the rights to—I don't know if it's the brand or or what—but uh, if it's anything related to that, that they had to clean up um, 
to do that Possibly. to sell it or not. So anyway, that's that's what I know about it. Mark, anything to add? Well, I think the main thing with this is, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, it was mentioned before on a, on the board or not, but I think the main problem is that there's it's not so much people's ownership of the stuff. I think it's the fact that Kiss are saying, you, sure, you can own the video, but you don't own the music. That's Kiss stuff, right? You know, if if you own, you know, if you if you boot if you do a bootleg video of something, okay, that video is yours. But you can't go now and start selling this or claiming ownership of it because that music is not yours; it's their music, right? So I think that's where the big issue comes into play, right? Yeah. So, so, so Lonnie, what's your take on all of this? No, I agree with with Mark that it's 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 selling something that has the music included on it, and they they own that music. Um, and then I, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. We all knew that at some point. With what was going on like a year ago this time that this would come to a head of some kind of kiss bided their time um and were professionals about it and, and just got everything <laughs> together um you know and, and did it very professionally mm. to um and, and and they'll have the last laugh although J julian's making us all laugh right now <laughs> yeah it's too bad you know that guy he he probably wrote one of the best kiss books ever uh with his partner there uh but lately he's been all going off the rails and uh, he's been shutting down kiss videos left and right and uh actually he's hassled some of the kiss fans like andrew skimberry <laughs> he's been blaming him for a lot of stuff that seems kind of out there you know kind of crazy i don't know maybe he's lost his mind so uh hopefully he'll get back on track and uh you know settle down a little bit julian is showing some 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 great stuff Show over. Off. yeah yeah uh but i know ken is an avid kiss collector but any one of you did you get any kiss stuff this week anything nope i didn't get okay. any kiss stuff but i actually I, I was very disappointed though yesterday because i went to go get the new Rolling Stones record, and mm -hmm. it was nowhere to be found anywhere in oh the greater Toronto area. Every store that I went to said the same thing that they're massively behind in the and getting product out to mm -hmm. all the places. But I did end up finding, luckily, a 10 inch single version of Angry. So I grabbed that at least. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, just to have something. What's the name of that store. album? Something with diamonds. Uh, Hackney Diamonds. Hackney Diamonds. Okay. Yeah. It's a good yeah. record. I mean, I, I, the, the Rolling Stones is something that I, thought, I never thought they would do, but I understand why they did it. The, the day it came out, which was yesterday, they released the whole album on their YouTube channel. The whole thing. Okay. All in lyric, lyric video version. And it's good. I mean, look, it, is it going to be, you know, let it bleed? No. Is it going to be goat's head soup? No. But it's really good. It's probably the best thing they've done in, like, Jesus, like, who knows how long. It's Mark, Mark, what's your favorite Rolling Stones song of all time? Favorite Rolling Stones song of all time? Uh, Mine is Bitch. Such a great song. Uh, bitch is good. Uh, I don't know. There, there's so many songs I like. I mean, I, I've, I've always, honestly... My favorite song is a, is a, is a single actually Honky Tonk Woman is my favorite song that they've ever uh, Honky done. Tonk I w we wouldn't have guessed that it's sort of a bluesy song that kind of cowbell I, I got to love I'd pick brown sugar brown sugar brown sugar I'd say brown sugar okay that's sort of a you know a sister song to Black Diamond maybe I can talk now yeah oh you can oh, talk now okay great <laughs> straight cat blues is my favorite Rolling Stone cat song. Blues. Yeah, okay. go and get go and get nice. Beggar's Banquet. That's kind far. of a deep cut, yeah. you know. No, you know, down the line as well, for that matter. Just fucking love the tempo. Watch Charlie Watts play mm -hmm. that, you know, back in the day on video. Uh, I got the whole album yesterday, and it's just been nonstop. 60 something year old band putting out an album mm -hmm. that strong. And yeah, I do like Latter Day. I like Bridges of Babylon. Voodoo Lounge. I, I do love the Rolling Stones pretty much from between the buttons on. Um, you know, Mick Jagger just, I think he hit 80 
how how does it sound on the record? Sounds better. Good. It sounds good. It sounds it sound, good. I mean, look. Sounds fantastic. Well, I mean, there's a couple like, of spots where it sounds like there's a little bit of wizardry. Go something. There's a little bit of magic yeah. going on. Uh, Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I was given the opportunity to talk, and I've been silent for five minutes. Come on, <laughs> um, go ahead. No, he he sounds really good. But the album, other than one song, uh, "Live by the Sword," I think it is, it, which doesn't do anything for me. The rest of it's fucking excellent. But he sounds great. The whole band does. Yeah. Okay, awesome. then let's move on to the actual topic of today. Ten cultural, you know, popular culture, cultural uh, events or things that have influenced you. Five kiss things and five others. I'll start off. The biggest thing for me when it comes to Kiss, the, the thing that influenced me the most is actually the song Hands of Fire. And just this week, I found this essay I wrote in the second grade. It's called, I'll translate it on, on, on the fly, it's called The Trip. And, and I mean, it says it all. The second grade, you know, and, and if you look closely, you see Kiss doodles, you know, everywhere. Uh, without makeup, of course, without makeup. Oh, Jeans, wow. uh, yeah. And on every page, <laughs> there is a kiss guy. Uh, yes. I'll just read this one. It's not that long. So uh, it goes like this The trip. I was going to Iceland, but something went wrong with the airplane. So we went to Pluto, and suddenly some aliens appeared. Then I played Heaven's on Fire, and they all fainted. The end. What a great story. But, you know, that's the second grade. Nothing oh, must have changed. So really, when I heard the song, I knew this is something special. This is something out of the ordinary. And that song has always been, you know, close to my heart, dear to my heart. It's been one of my favorites ever since. And it's kind of strange because everything else has changed. You know, I don't read the same stuff. I don't like the same movies. But this song has been with me since, I guess, 1985, somewhere around there. Because that was when I was in second grade. So it's kind of cool. So one of my biggest Kiss influences is, of course, the song Hands on Fire. What about you, Ken? <laughs> you started well, a bit earlier. It, yeah, uh, Kiss influence. I mean... Mine is more around kind of events. Um, I don't know what you want, my top event or my whatever. Um, but uh, one of them is, well, I'll just go with the one. The, the big one was was uh, listening or hearing, you know, the beginning of uh, Rock and Roll Over and hearing I Want You. Yeah. Um, seeing that you know, with my friend showing me, my new friend actually at the time, because I had just moved to California, um, and he played that and then showed me that, he he played that and showed me the album cover at the, around the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like the impact of it all at once, you know, the, the cover of Rock and Roll Over, you know, cartoonish and stuff like that, and then yeah. the, the, the way the music started, e you know, easy and then kicked in heavy. Um, I mean that that was it, you know. Right there is is the big, you know, major event that really made me become a Kiss fan. I don't know. It may have taken longer, you know, down the line for me to uh, become a Kiss fan. I, it may it may have taken maybe uh, a year later or something like that. I'm thinking because I probably would have watched Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park and that sort of stuff. So. Um, <laughs> I but, think Rock and Roll Over is a better start than Phantom of the yes. Park. That was that was yeah that was it was a good start. Um, um, so that that was the that was the big event that started it all, and uh, you know I've been a fan pretty much ever you know, since. since since then. So yeah. that was back in seventy seven, early probably around March, April seventy seven, something like that. Very cool story, Ken. Thank you. Uh, but what about Julian? You entered your Kiss Phantom a bit later. Um, can you mention one of your, you know, biggest things in, in your Kiss story? Well, the biggest influence is clearly the starting point, Tears Are Falling video on MTV. That moment that I saw that um, is the moment I became a fan. And from there, I was all in. 
So it speaks for itself, the power of that song to like history. Yeah, that's true. Lonnie, then. Um, for me, it, although it was in the early 80s, for me, it was Destroyer, actually. My brother had a, a cassette copy of Destroyer. And my eldest brother was born to country music, but he brought home Destroyer. And like hearing that for the first time was just totally different than any music I had ever heard in the house or any music I had ever heard, period. <laughs> uh, I wonder if it's Mark's pick as well. Right. So for me, it was we just wore out that that tape of Destroyer. We listened to it just over and over and over and over, and that's what that's what started it. For me. <clears throat> what a great start! What about Mark then? Well, first of all, I got to say though, Daniel, that your story was very impressive, and that <laughs> you're you must have some impressive air, air like aviation technology there to fly from Iceland <laughs> to, Pluto to Pluto immediately. That's some good good engines you got there. Pluto. Yeah, so uh, very, very impressive. Uh, for me, I mean, I, d I did write down five uh, KISS-related events that were very important to me. Uh, yeah. One of them was, for sure, uh, uh, Christmas time when I was about 10. My sister bought for me KISS Alive on vinyl. And uh, I remember the very first time I got that, opened it, you know, took out that booklet and saw those amazing pictures in the little four-page booklet that came in there. And putting that on, and I always said this, the Kiss Alive is meant to be listened to on headphones, very yeah. loud, because then it, then it feels like you're right there in the center of the whole arena listening to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and back then when, you're, when, when I'm 10 years old, I didn't know all this stuff about it being re-recorded and all this other stuff that I came to realize later. And that's the thing I've always said. When you get into the music world and start learning about things, when you become an engineer and stuff like that, it's almost a curse more than a blessing because all those magical moments that you've had when you're younger with these records start becoming a little bit dull because of it. You're like, oh, this isn't as live as I thought it was when I was 10 years mm. old. But, you know, it, that, that doesn't matter. I mean, that, that memory for me will always be precious because sitting in my room listening to that, with those old ancient Philips headphones that my dad had, and listening to this crowd chanting and screaming and the pyro that was going off in it and stuff. It was something yeah. I never heard before, you know? I mean, I had just gotten into music very recently before then, th discovering my sister's copy of Rush Exit Stage Left. That's the first thing that got me into music. But the Kiss album that got it for me was, you know, Kiss Alive. So that's always been a very important part of my upbringing. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, for me, uh, I discovered Kiss Alive after Animalize Asylum and Lick It Up and Creatures of the Night. And I found out, whoa, there's a whole back catalog mm -hmm. and there are some great tunes. And I remember first time I heard Kiss Alive, Firehouse was the ones that stuck out to me. Uh, I thought it was a great song. Later on, I, my view it might have changed a little bit, but, but that was the first one that grabbed me off of kiss alive but such a great record okay uh, but you guys i know you have other interests than kiss of course and other popular culture that has influenced you so i would like to know some of the other stuff that has influenced you i'll start off the first thing that really got me you know in 1983 actually swedish we only had two channels in sweden uh, and one of the channels actually broadcast uh, the new, uh, what's it called? New uh, Star Wars, A New Hope, you know, the first mm. Star Wars movie. Yeah. And I was blown away. I, I had never seen anything like it. And I don't know. I think I might have had, you know, like um, I liked stuff that, you know, looked cool and stuff happened. And Star Wars really fit that that mold, you know, like Kiss, uh, spectacular. And uh, I, I watched that movie back in 83 and I was blown away. And I've been a Star Wars fan ever since, even though some of the later movies I kind of, I don't know about, I know Lana likes Star Wars as well, but, but I think they, um, you know, dropped the ball on, on some of the later movies. But... Uh, but that first one really struck a chord. You know, it was so good. And all the characters. And I guess I like the mask, you know, Darth Vader and 
and, and all, all the stormtroopers and i like the way they looked and uh, I'm I'm really into art as well. I, I like drawing and stuff like that. So I think it uh, it has something to do with, with that. But Star Wars, the first movie that was released in '77, was a big influence for me and still is to this day. What about you, Lonnie? Yeah, Star Wars is really high up there um, for me as well. I've talked about it before on the show, and you know I I think there's something to be said. I think a lot of Kiss fans are yeah. Star Wars fans. Yeah. I think it's because Star, Star Wars is so visually exciting, mm -hmm. and so is a Kiss show is very visually exciting. Mm -hmm. um, that happens quite a bit, where you t if, if you're with fellow Kiss fans, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a big Star Wars guy too. And maybe it's just because Star Wars came out in 77, and Kiss was really big in 77 also, and it's just had a very, a lot of fans that, you know may have been in a very influential part of their lives, and like those two things just hit home with them. But I think that the um, the visual, for me, people have asked about that. And I've always said that I think it's the visual excitement that that both a Kiss show brings and that Star Wars brings. Um, did something to my brain, does something to my brain that that my brain just gravitates towards. So yeah, the, the original Star Wars trilogy is, is huge for me. And I do like those prequels as well. They've grown on me over the years. Um, but the uh, the sequel Phantom trilogy. Menace. Phantom I do Menace. like the Phantom Menace. I do. It, it, it's it's very underrated in my opinion. But those uh, it's like those, the elder of Disney... Star Wars. <laughs> those, <laughs> those Disney sequel trilogy does not does not sit well with me. I have I have my issues with those. But oh, yeah. but Star Wars is is definitely high up there as far as influence goes with me. Yeah, that's some really interesting thoughts. It, it will be interesting to see if you chime in with your comments, uh, people who are listening. If you like Star Wars as well, it, it will be kind of interesting to see. Uh, Mark? Yes. Well, for me, it's actually interesting because, you know, the, the big thing, like you said, amongst the KISS people are Star Wars and stuff like that. Uh, but for me, it's something different kind of impacted me when I was growing up. And I, I've, I found that this is more commonplace with not so much KISS fans, although I'm sure there are KISS fans that like this too, but this is more popular or prevalent amongst the progressive community. And that is when I was about eight, we have this channel called TV Ontario. It's like a p public television channel. And every night at around seven o'clock, this show would come on. Do do. And this weird headed guy would appear on TV. I'm, Who the hell is that? And it was Tom Baker and it was Doctor Who. And I remember the very first time I saw Doctor Who was what when he was the doctor at that time, or they were they were broadcasting it at that time. I don't think there was any I don't even remember what the doctor was at that time in the 80s, it was probably like Peter Davison or somebody at that point. But uh I remember watching those episodes and thinking, what the hell is this? There was all kinds of weird aliens and time traveling and stuff like that and uh you know just unbelievable stuff you know for a young kid to watch and i i was just you know and seeing like you know the cybermen and stuff like that i was just i was instantly hooked and it was something that stayed with me for a long time and even to the point of when i broke my leg back in like 2012 i think it was and i was in hospital for a few months I, I was getting a little bored sitting in the hospital room so i became a good friend of amazon.com or .ca, and I ended up ordering, and I literally have in my bedroom over there, almost every single episode of Doctor Who from William Hartnell right up to, uh, I believe it was Matt Smith was the last guy I collected up to. So I got like near like 150, 250 episodes of Doctor Who on DVD in in my house, and I've probably watched all of them multiple times. Uh, mm -hmm. Doctor Who was big for me. I'm very big into science, as you'll see later on as we talk about more of our influences. But science was always a big thing for me. So Doctor Who fit in right there perfectly. What about Ken, then? You're muted, You're muted. once again. <laughs> My gosh, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> um, kind of on my list, keeping in with, I guess, your sci-fi kind of theme um i'll pick one from my list um and it is uh it's actually star trek um and and i used to you know come home and watch that after after school you know all the the reruns and stuff when i was young um 
and I thought it was great. You know, it, it, it kind of got me into technology um, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, kind of influenced me there because um, it's so interesting how you know these little communicators, which mm. <laughs> you know they become phones is later on, yeah. and, and, yeah. and touch screen stuff like and, you know all that stuff. It's like a lot of it became uh, real down the road. It's just kind of amazing. But um, uh, so that that was a big deal for me uh, as far as, you know, being into technology, liking that kind of stuff. Adve- you know, it's 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 uh, adventure kind of stuff. And that's what, you know, Star Wars is. I, it wasn't on my list, but I'm a big Star Wars fan too, like you guys. Okay. And, and, you know, I went to that movie, the, the first movie in the theater when it came out. Daniel. Mm. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a, I'm a big fan of that one too. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of more of the fantastical adventure, you know, side of things, um, that I like. So Star Wars fans and Trek is on the show. I didn't know you were so much into, in, into, into oh, yeah. the, Trek the original. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. The original, so the later movies, though. the later ones are okay. I mean, yeah. I like some of the you know, the con, you know, those movies, you know, those are all <laughs> are yeah. good and so on, but uh, yeah, 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 Julian, bunch of nerds, yeah, Doctor we, are, we are Star Trek, <laughs> we Star are. Wars. No, yeah. I mean, gr- growing up in England at that time, um, Star Wars, and it's not a new hope, it is Star Wars have any of that revisionist bullshit near me um the episode yeah yeah, i mean that's one of the only movies i ever remember seeing in a cinema in britain before we moved to america but you know growing up there there was a limited amount of kind of science fiction that i remember i did watch uh tom baker i believe era doctor who so exterminate exterminate and (laughs) that's awesome um But there was something called Space 1999, oh, yeah. which yes. was on. That. And that is the only one I remember actually being a fan of. Now, does it influence me? No. Um, it, but again, I, it's the only thing I remember from living in England, really, because I was pretty young when we left. So, you know, what becomes more important to me is when the next generation came out in the late 80s for Star, uh, for Star Trek because mm. there is a lot of hype and excitement that went around that, that it was finally one of these great science fiction things was becoming serial TV. Um, so it was very exciting. Everyone had watched the original uh, Star Trek. Star Wars was done and over with at that point. Didn't, you know, it had its, had its moment, but the next generation was actually setting or felt like it was setting a new standard by becoming a TV show that you could tune into every week um, mm-hmm. and relive that experience. So next generation, all this, all this stuff that you guys have talked about led me into um the next generation, which to this day re- remains the uh, the Star Trek that I want to watch, can still watch. Ah, that's cool. So let's move one. on to Kiss Influence number two. And I think I'll, I'll do these in chronological order. First one was Heavens of Fire, but the second one was actually, I, I remember this vividly, watching the Tears of Falling video much as Julian said. So for me, the tier of following video was really important for me. Uh, and as I mentioned, we only had two channels in Sweden when I was young. And there was once a week you could watch new music. And there, there was a music music show. And they uh, broadcast the Tears of Falling video. And I was blown away. By that time, I, I had heard Heaven So Far. So I, I was looking for... And I remember using like... Uh, radio to record off of the tv the tears are falling <laughs> yeah sound audio you know the the audio from 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 the the video uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's how old i am so uh that was really important and to this day i think it's a cool video i think it's the best video off of that album and uh, i like the volcano i like the, I, I like the clothes <laughs> i think paul looks real cool i like when he swings in you know when he comes in swinging swinging and um i actually like that video to this day but i guess it has something to do with nostalgia but mm-hmm. such a great song as well you know a great follow-up to the animalized record so 
uh, tears are falling but it was the video not the song that much the video was really important to me and uh, um, if I look through this old thing from the second grade my, my little book here from second grade I'm sure I'll find some some strange looking clothes on on Paul Stanley because uh, I really like drawing and you know doing those the, the 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 things he were at that time you know it, it didn't stand the test of time but to me it's still cool mm -hmm. and the tears are falling i'm just bummed out they didn't play it play it on the on on this last leg of of the uh you know the farewell tour no not, not the farewell tour the end of the road tour <laughs> you know yeah. yes i would have liked to seen it once more but but uh, what the heck okay uh Laurie, then um, another one, it, it, it's kind of in the same vein that Destroyer was for me, and that's Creatures of the Night. We had, you know, a second cassette, and it was Creatures of the Night. Um, were just, just huge um, influences for me very early, at a very, very young age. Um, Creatures of the Night was right up there. You know, and then I started to get, you know, other cassettes and other albums, you know, and now I'll, I'll get to revenge because that's going to be a big shocker. That's going to be a big, that's going to be, you know, a big influence for me as well. Yeah. But, but creatures was, was definitely up there as well. I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, we had two kiss albums, destroyer and creatures, and we just played them and played them and played them and played them. And, um, good picks cr creatures is just so good. They're, they're, they're so similar, but they're so different from one another. And I talk about on the show all the time that I love, one thing I love, love about Kiss is that I can listen to the same band, but yet the music is so different from one album to the other. It's not like ACDC. I love ACDC, but ACDC sounds the same no matter if it came out in 1975 or if it came out last year. Yeah. <laughs> Mark. Yes. Well, for me, um, it's interesting because, uh, believe it or not, there was a po moment in time where I, I didn't like leave kiss fandom but it was starting to like wane a little thin on me for a little yeah. while there uh mm -hmm. mainly it was around the time of like hot in the shade around there i was kind of like yeah, me too. I, was, I was starting to like just completely like check turn off from the, and you know there's a lot of other things going on at the time you know guns and roses were out and stuff like that and other bands were starting to make the, the you know the scene and there's That's a lot right. of stuff going on in the in Toronto especially even with with new with independent bands and stuff like that that were pretty popular here uh lots of stuff was going on so it, it kind of uh you know wasn't on my radar and then I met this guy because I, I was forming a, a band and uh me and my guy who was singing in the band we we met up with this guy uh, I've, I've mentioned him before a few times before on this uh, podcast. His name was Ted, and he came and auditioned for our band. And when, after he was, you know, cool, and we decided to keep him and have him in the band, uh, I went over to his place, and it was one of those moments where, thanks to him, he kickstarted my second wave of Kiss, you know, fandom, with with a song that he played for me and i'm sure lonnie will give me the thumbs up on this one which was he when he played unholy yeah. off of revenge i mean it was mm -hmm. the first time i heard that and I, and I remember the exact words to him i said who is this and he goes it's kiss and i looked at him i said nah this i was just could not convinced that it was when i first heard it because you know from what i remember hearing this was a lot heavier a lot more in your face Hell but yeah. as soon as he heard gene start seeing it's like okay now it started to become a little bit more clear that it was right uh, and then that whole album we listened to that that afternoon when, we were, when I was at his place, and you know, and, and just hanging around with him too kind of helped rekindle my uh, wave of Kiss fandom again because he he had everything in his house. Like I said before, I I know that lots of people say when I when I hear these interviews when when people do these interviews with Kiss collectors, and they say, well, you know. I, I collect a lot of Kiss stuff, but I could just have it down here in my basement because my wife would kill me, ho, 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 if I had it upstairs anywhere else in the house. This guy, I have no word of a lie, he couldn't give a rat's ass what his wife told him. <laughs> he had Kiss on mass plaque in the middle of the living room over the fireplace. He had a Kiss Ace's flaming guitar framed in the kitchen. He had Kiss stuff everywhere, and <laughs> nobody was going to tell him in his house where he could have his Kiss stuff 
whether it was upstairs, downstairs, in the washroom, wherever. He had Kiss stuff everywhere. So he also got me reinterested in the whole, you know, that end of it, you know, collecting posters and stuff like that and all this cool stuff that I didn't, didn't know about. And that'll get to another area of my Kiss thing later. The follow-up question has yeah. to be, is he still married to the same girl? No, he's not married no, to the same girl. No, he's not. He's not. Okay. No. Let's move on to Julian. Julian. Okay, Kiss Influence, right? Yeah. Because I had no time to think about this since I wasn't going to be here. All right, no. um, which is why I just got up and grab items. This. Ah. Ah. Exposed, the video. Yeah. So, obviously, coming very early on after becoming a fan, this was essentially my entry point to rare video and bootlegs um i can't remember if i was already buying bootlegs from the local music shop uh, by that time but this was a real eye-opener because when you're starting you're learning about a band that you hadn't well at least for me hadn't connected with what i was seeing in tears are falling with their whole history in makeup could have been two separate bands with the same name for all i knew at that point this was really the connective material that led me back into that whole original era of the band and the videos that i hadn't seen or didn't even know that existed that presented an incredible contrast to what we were experiencing in the 1980s with animalized live uncensored when it was the mtv concert so kiss exposed yeah ken yeah, another uh, big event, and we've talked about that. Um, <laughs> talked about this many times is the time I bought my first, just buying the first Kiss album, uh, my first Kiss album, not the first Kiss album, but my first Kiss album, which was Alive too. That was something uh, I'll just, I just never forget. I can, I can still picture, you know, the whole thing, writing down, going down, going to Bill's drugstore, and going through the small selection of vinyl and and bringing it home and, and the whole bit and then you know opening alive too and seeing that in you know inner gate flow gatefold of the uh you know concert stage of 77 and it's like wow you know it just blows you away and then putting putting it on and then putting it on for the first time not, not knowing who's singing i mean i didn't know if Paul was singing Paul songs or Gene, I, cause I didn't know them well enough yet. I was still, you just starting to get into it and figure it all out. And then reading, Oh, this guy wrote this song and this guy seems to always sound like this when it's written by this guy. And it's like, okay, so this is Gene Simmons. And then the whole, you know, you just kind of figured it out and then alive too. And then kind of tying in with that on the same level is, you know, buying, I was buying all anything, any magazine with kiss, kiss in it um the rock and roll magazine 16 magazine whatever and i was pasting you know these posters and pages all over my walls and, and that sort of stuff so it, it that was a, a big deal too after you know obviously the first one that i talked about earlier getting the first album and then going down the rabbit hole after that was you know that got it all really started at least as far as buying the vinyl and getting into the all the music yeah, I'm sure Alive 2 made a lot of, you know, was the entry point for a lot of KISS fans. Such a great yeah. record. But let's move on to other influences. Pick number two. And for me, it's an old movie from 1985. I don't know if if, if you guys like this one, but it's Rocky IV. And what did I like about Rocky IV? Well, uh, I started to get interested in boxing and... Uh, the soundtrack to Rocky IV is, to this day, awesome. You know, when if you like to work out, you know, you can put on that soundtrack to this day and it really works. And after watching Rocky V in 85, no, not Rocky V. Rocky V, you shouldn't not watch. Rocky V. Not, not Rocky V. I mean, Rocky IV. <laughs> Rocky IV. Then it was downhill, but but Rocky IV, you know, Russia against America, and of course we mm. we 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 liked America, we didn't like Russia, we still don't like Russia, you know. Uh, and uh, <laughs> after the movie, you know, the whole Mike Tyson phenomenon started. You know, mm. he started knocking out people left and right, so that got me into boxing. So Rocky V is a big. I rewatched it actually this weekend with one of my uh, kids and. Uh, 
she's just 10 years old, but she liked it and she liked the music. So hopefully she'll, you know, carry on the torch. Uh, what about Julian then? Another influence than Kiss. What to to my life? Non Kiss influence, yeah. Non a non Kiss influence to a my life is Kiss influence, yeah. Is classical music. Hmm. Yeah. Um, growing up, the ma majority of the music that I heard around the house was Vivaldi, Mozart, Bach, yeah. um, which stuff. you know led me on a path of discovery. I didn't listen to really a lot for a long period of time, other than classical. Uh, you know. Um, discovering Rachmaninoff and Wagner, some of the heavier. You want heavy music. Wagner is heavy. There's some heavy music in the Va classical Valkyries, world. Valkyries, you know, the, 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 what's the March of the Valkyries or whatever it's called, you know, mm -hmm. that song. Such a cool song. I, I mean, there, there's so much very good stuff. I mean, what do Ace Frehley and uh, Beethoven have in common? Both deaf as a doornail, you know, so, <laughs> and it doesn't stop them from making music. So, um, you know, that really led me on a path. And when a movie like Amadeus came out, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a load of, it's a load of waffle, um, but it's absolutely fantastic that it marries the music uh, the operas, the symphonic work that he was doing, and makes it presentable to the masses. With that, it's got a good evil guy with Salieri. Um, so, classical music to this day, cool. you, you know, find something, you know, and and dig in because there's a lot of connections yeah. with uh, heavy metal as well. True, that's that's really a cool pick. And you know, I mentioned Rocky Four. There's a lot of songs in there that kind of reminds um is remini reminiscent of of a classical music you know sorry like best war. best rocky song is not yeah. eye of the tiger it's living no. in america james fucking brown <laughs> no. Even, uh, i wouldn't oh pick that goodness. one but it's a great song yeah laurie then um well i guess you can look behind me and, and say that <laughs> the, uh, the bangles are, are are a big deal to me um How does it all start no. we all want to know that <laughs> well it, it started during super bowl 23 ken had a much different experience of super bowl 23 than i did yeah. um <laughs> but super bowl 23 i was about 10 years old and the st louis football cardinals had moved from st louis to arizona and so there was no mm. team in st louis but i'm watching the super bowl with my dad and i asked my dad i go well, who's the i knew joe montana was a quarterback of the 49ers and I said, well, who's the quarterback of the Bengals, Dad? And he said, Boomer Esiason. And as a 10-year-old kid, a quarterback by the name of Boomer was Boomer. about the coolest <laughs> thing I had ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I really liked their helmets with the striped helmets and that. So I became a fan that night. And I always say that they broke my heart that night, and they have been ever since. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Lonnie. Now we know how it all started. That's it. Uh, Yep, Ken then. Okay, what should we do? <laughs> the, the the other, the second the non other influence. influence. Non Not kiss. kiss. Influence. Okay, yeah. one of them. Well, will be. Come on. Um, <laughs> the another one would be um, the Beatles and the Beach Boys, and um, mm -hmm. among other music um, that I grew up listening to. You know, I know when I was probably three years old that my eldest sister, who's a huge Beatles fan, um, this is like she's like nine years older than me, uh, was heavily into that. And she was playing the Beatles a lot. And then the Beach Boys came after that. And then there's other music that I heard them, you know, my sisters play. I have multiple sisters. So uh, it kind of influenced me. Um, but definitely the, the Beatles, for the most part, and the Beach Boys, but the Beatles were a, a very, you know, I heard it and I was like, man, this is this is good stuff. But, you know, I didn't try to listen to I didn't have to put it on record or anything. It, it was already playing on their little, you know, stereos and stuff like that. And it was on the radio all the time. So that kind of stuff got me interested in music in general, and then melodic, you know, well-written yeah. songs. Um, I've always, always enjoyed. Um, 
while the city where... sleeps <clears throat> while the city sleeps well written songs while know? the city sleeps yeah. dance all over your face it has a yeah. good yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i do like dance all over your face yeah I know. but anyway we got that before um but uh yeah i mean i i i went from there and then later on i it influenced me to and then i finally got more stuff that was melodic you know like the carpenters and Mm -hmm. and and uh you know neil sadaka and then other stuff i kept you know paul simon and linda ronstadt Ron yeah. it grew and then since you know, steve miller band and then and then it, things i got more of a harder edge then then went more progressive a little bit you know with rush and and even though their their music is it's still a lot of catchy stuff, even though it's kind of progressive, you know, it is progressive, but mm -hmm. it was different. And then still Kiss, they wrote, you know, they did write. They were trying to be that, like they said, the heavy metal Beatles or whatever. And there's a lot of catchy stuff that uh, they wrote. Um, so th that all influenced it, everything down the roads. And, and I've gone into the now new rabbit hole of Blue Oyster Cult um uh, which i never really gave them a chance but now it's like holy crap why did i not look at all this stuff and i've been buying all <laughs> original vinyl for their stuff and I, i've been listening to a lot of it over and over and it's like man this is a lot of cool stuff that they did i only had like a couple things of theirs but i i went into the rest as i like, oh man i really missed out but i'm glad i'm getting getting into it now at least you know now or never the voice of reason telling it like it is. You're almost <laughs> too sophisticated to be a Kiss fan. Well, let's move no. on to Mark. <laughs> Mark. Um, well, one of my other influences, and it's got to be said, this is probably one of the big ones for me. Uh, and, and I never realized just how much this person influenced me until reviewing things in my life. And it's my, my father. Uh, back in the day... Uh, he was the first person who actually introduced me to guitar playing. He he had a little classical guitar in our house, and he used to always play these like Johnny Cash songs and stuff like that. And when I was very small, I remember I used to always sit down on the floor and watch him play, and always kind of you know think to myself, "Wow, I I, I want to play guitar like that when you know I was older." And you know, and my dad was also uh, an like an inventor scientist guy he and our basement was always littered with all kinds of his inventions i mean years back before this whole craze of elect electric cars and stuff my dad was working on magnetic motors and stuff that didn't need fuel to do all kinds of stuff you would never even believe in our house that we had here that he would work on and he was also big on repairing injection molding machines so he used to go do these kind of repair trips to the to the, to the, to the united states usa usa to repair their uh pressing and, and i go to pressing plants with them like record plants because they had the pressing machines that they used sometimes they would hmm. fuck up so he would have to go there and repair them right and I, this is before I got into records long before. So I never realized all these things that I did with my father, how much it shaped me subconsciously for later in my yeah. life. Like all this stuff that happened. I, I was in these record plants. And, and that's why whenever I hear people talking about, you know, record plants and they're talking about how, what you know, when people say that records are dirty, you should probably clean them before you, you know, put them on your turntable. And you're like, no, nah, what are you talking about? I can tell you firsthand. I've went into some record pressing plants and man, you wouldn't want to bring any kind of food or anything in there. There's dust and shit all over the place in these plants. <laughs> and you better clean your records when you get them new because these oh, pressing yeah. plants are far from cleanly, you know, and I've seen them firsthand. I've been in there myself. Okay. So, uh, you know, and my dad also was when I was in, around that age, around 10 or 11, he had a job where he was actually repairing audio consoles like big mixing consoles like he would that was his job like he would take out the channel strips and re-solder all these things and stuff he's very good with a soldering gun and stuff like that so and, and years later i became one of these people who worked on mixing consoles and did an apprenticeship for sound engineering and stuff like that so it, it's incredible when i look back at it now mm -hmm. how much what he did kind of affected my life down the line and it was never one of those things where he said to me 
you should become a scientist, Mark, or you should do this. He never did that. He always, he always supported whatever I wanted to do. You know, I played soccer for a long time since I was the, like from the age of five to about, I think about 16. Once I found the guitar, soccer became out the Such window for me. But, yeah. but my father was my coach of my team for a long time. You know, I got into rep soccer for a while. I was, my, my dad was secretly, I think, hoping that I would take it more seriously because I was actually pretty good, believe it or not, at one time at soccer. But once I found the guitar, you know, that was the end of soccer. But he 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 did guide and steer my life in ways that I didn't really even realize. Yeah, your father sound, sounds like a real cool guy. So um, that's that's a real personal story. Nice to hear. Uh, my father, he never played a record, for example. <laughs> He never played really. anything. He just wanted me to work in the forest, you know, cutting down trees. <laughs> you have to work, boy. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. But, so I, I don't know really how I, I got into music. But one thing, let's move on to Kiss influences. And my third pick, you know, I had Heavens of Fire, Tears of Falling. And then, like one of you guys said, I think it was Mark, um, when Hard in the Shade came out, I had kind of a down period. Of, big, in my Kiss fandom, because uh, I didn't really like the record. I, I didn't. It felt like they were, uh, you know, they, they didn't hit the mark anymore. So, uh, but then, of course, in '92, I stayed up late, Headbangers Ball in Europe, 12 o'clock <laughs> on Sundays. I didn't care. I was. I would be dead tired all Monday long when I, and this was when I was attending, I think you say second up and dairy school or how do you Secondary say dairy school? Second. Yeah. You know, when you're like 16, 17, yeah, high school. School. Yeah. middle school. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. As, so I stayed up and I hit the record button button and it was the unholy video. I mean, mm. kiss was back big time. It was the best video I'd seen from Kiss in 10 years. And um, suddenly Kiss was kind of cool, at least at my, do you say high school or whatever you say in, mm -hmm. in, in English? I don't know. But, but, but Kiss was kind of cool or at least respected. They respected Unholy. They respected Revenge. My friends who had looked down at my fandom, they kind of said, well, this last record and Unholy, it's, it's a pretty good, cool song. <laughs> so, um, and I loved Unholy, the video, and the studio version of Unholy is just one of their greatest tracks ever. I think a perfect Gene song. So the Unholy video was a big influence for me. Uh, Julian, Kiss influence. That's easy. Black, Black Diamond. Diamond. Mm. By, Look, by yeah. Dale Sherman. This is still my mm -hmm. original copy from 1997. And good. see if I can get it. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So I was living in Scotland at the time that this came out and couldn't find it. And Dale was online. Uh, you know, back in the day, a lot went on on the KALL, the AOL Kiss mm. um, yeah. chats. And he sent this to me. But Apart from teaching me about being a classy human being and a really nice guy, which Dale remains to this day. Um, and so what about I, you then? Well, <laughs> this is the this was the inspiration for the Kiss album focus and doing something yeah, like good. it yeah, on cool. Kiss Asylum. And while I disavow all knowledge and connection with the Kiss album focus these days, <laughs> uh, because Jeez. I like to think I've grown past that. Um, uh, it did serve as the inspiration, which was the foundation for the insane journey that I've taken creatively, where I'm learning with each project that I do and improving, hopefully, some of my skills. I'm not going to say talents because I don't look at it that way, but hopefully developing my craft in what I'm trying to do and what remains a very interesting thing. So Dale Sherman, Black Diamond, massive yeah, we, influence, obviously. Yeah, We all have to say that Julian has been, you know, like a super guy for us he's always been there for us he's always uh you know anyone who ha has wanted to be on this podcast has been able to be a, a part of it much because of julian's uh, way of thinking i mean if you want to do it do it he's not been he, he he's never put up you know like uh, walls 
walls <laughs> or or uh, anyone borders. who's borders anyone who's been interested in interested in doing the podcast has been allowed and the same goes with his writing his his uh He's a really good writer, and we're hoping to see more books coming from Julian because we all enjoy them. And I do hope that Julian understands that we all appreciate his, his works, his works, yes. and he's better than I think he is because at I'm times feeling very you, uncomfortable right no, now. No, yeah, yeah, you, you <laughs> just shut up. And <laughs> you know, at times Oops. he downplays his own um, okay, achievements. You know. He's written some of the best kiss books around, and uh, we all know this. This, but as the writer himself, Julian, you know, at times he seems to uh, think he, he, he he's not really a writer. But you are a writer, Julian, and you do great stuff, and we all appreciate it. And it's uh, it uh, it's uh, liked all around the globe, you know. And hated everywhere around the world. But thank you, I appreciate the kind yeah. words. I'm continuing yeah. to work at that my craft. Yeah, you're doing a great job. Uh, but Lonnie, let's hear your your influence. Well, kind of going in chronological order, and I talked about yep. this a little bit ago, um, that to echo what, what Daniel just mentioned a little bit ago, when Revenge came out, yep. um, it was a game changer in my KISS fandom. It became more than just this band that we had a couple cassettes of that we listened to a lot. It was, it was really good, good music. Um, Revenge came out and they looked, they looked the part. Finally, they sounded the part and it was a great album. Um, and it just propelled me from, Oh, it's one of the bands that I like, like guns and roses. I like kiss too. And it's not to become to put kiss up here um, to put it, put kiss on a pedestal for me. And, you know, I, I, I talk about that album on this show for many years now, how much it means to me and what it, what it did for me um, as a person. And it just, it made me who I made a, a big part of who I am today is because of, of revenge and the time that it came out. Um, it's just so damn good um, from start to finish. So Re revenge just did it for me. And you guys talked about the, the unholy video and, you know, and, and not only that, but then the, I just won a video also, um, in like May and, and, and summer of, of 92, um, was a staple on MTV for a band for kiss, a band that didn't get a whole lot of MTV play. They played the, I just won a video quite a bit on MTV in the summer of 92. Um, and I, and and they looked so great in that video. They really did. The, the white background and the black leather and the the raunchy song. I mean, it, it was perfect. It's so um, cool to hear. It's so cool to hear that uh, people get influenced by albums recorded uh, after, you know, like 78. You know, people underestimate the the value of studio albums because I've heard loads of fans becoming fans like by listening to the psycho circus album for example which i don't like but studio albums are so important so it's unfortunate they they stopped you know releasing those because i think they would have made even more fans if they would have continued uh, mark yes um yeah so before we get to my number three i do have to echo daniel's comments about julian he's been fantastically supportive in all things on here his books oh, yeah. are very important to me i must say personally because there's been many a times where i've been sitting in here working on my own music and if i ever come to like a roadblock or something and, and you might find this humorous or funny julian but if i ever get stuck with something i always pull out like either your paul ace peter or uh book their gene book or I'd pull out The Elder, and I'll always flip through some of my favorite parts, like, you know, the Rob Freeman interview about The Elder, about his recording of the album, or, you know, anything to do with, you know, those kind of spe specific things uh, that I love about Kiss, like the recording end of things and all these specific deep dives that you do. And it doesn't take me very long after I read some of this stuff where I start getting re-excited about music all of a sudden, and then, bam, an idea will come back to me, and I'm back on here, and I'm working on music. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm on record 
10 almost now of Project Gemini. I have two more that I've done that I haven't even released yet. So motivation is important to me and your books do that. So I just want to say it's, it is important to me. Thank you. Uh, but well, I do want to say that, uh, you know, that it is important. If you haven't gotten Julian's books, look into them. They're, they're definitely worth getting and worth every penny that they, that you spend on them. Uh, so my kiss uh, one here that I'm going to talk about real quick is something that I was very happy I was able to attend. And this played a huge part, uh, again, in that second wave of my KISS fandom. And that is when KISS came to Toronto on the 96 reunion tour. When they first came here, when they re-got the makeup back on and they came here, it was really important, I think, for me to go and see it because I grew up with my older sister, Jane. That's everybody on this podcast knows about her. Uh, and she was a huge influence on my KISS you know, upbringing in the early stages. And she always used to tell me about, you know, these KISS shows and how it's amazing. You, should, you know, too bad you never were old enough at the time to see them in 77 or 76, you know, because I was only like three years old back then, right? So when this came around and I went to go see them, man, I mean, it, it was like, I kind of viewed it almost like my chance now to kind of see what those times could have been like. I know that's, you know, a lot larger scale than 77 in those times were. But just the idea of how people felt back in those days when they saw a KISS concert, I kind of got that feeling that that's what it was like when I saw them then in 96. It was just one of those feelings that I'll never forget. I mean, just even when they when they dimmed the lights and they started with the whole, all right, Toronto, that whole bit there was like, wow, I couldn't believe I was there to, to see that firsthand, you know, because that was such a, it was such a great moment for me to, to see that. And uh, yeah, I, from then on in, it was like full steam ahead with my KISS fanhood. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for your input. Uh, Ken. Yeah, after about a year into going down the KISS rabbit hole um, in 78, you know, 45 years ago this month, um, a couple of things, uh, you know, happen is the the solo albums came out and then also the uh kiss meets the phantom of the park um happened uh, so i remember getting the solo albums i remember going to get two you know it was, it was great it's like oh wow you know and we're still getting into kiss i probably bought a number of albums by that time and then then you get four solo albums coming out um and buying gene and paul first uh, on one trip, and then probably a week or two later, uh, I bought the you know Ace and Peter, um, and, and just listening to those uh, for the first time and seeing the diversity of the of mm -hmm. how they're di you know they're not all sounding like Kiss music. They're they're you know different in their own way, um, and that sort of thing, which is it was very you know, and I was fine with it, open to it. Um, and then, uh, then a little bit, you know, like a week or later or whatever, Kiss Me Stefano with the Park, watching that, that was a, a big, a big deal, a big event, mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, just kind of, um, just like, yeah, I do like this stuff, especially when they, when they came on the screen finally, when they finally appeared. I mean, mm -hmm. after the opening credits. And then you had to wait forever for them to appear again. And then there, you know, you see them on stage playing. It's like, okay, this is, th that was the first time me seeing them perform actually yeah. uh, on a stage on TV. Mm -hmm. I, I had never seen them. You just saw the pictures and that was a big thing. It's like, oh, yeah. it's like, wow, oh, look at that. This is so cool. Look at them, you know, move around and all that, you know, all the stuff going on, uh, you know, and then the fireworks and, and whatnot and i was like man i can't wait to you know go see them so that was a, a, a big deal for me to, to actually finally see that plus the solo albums it's all like in that one month um, of october it was just you know it's fantastic time nice to hear that that movie wasn't a total waste of money okay let's go to the <laughs> other influences uh i actually picked a musical influence now and it was Actually, the first album I got, it was released in 84. It was a by a band kind of similar to Kiss, and it was Twisted Sister, Stay Hungry, mm. 84. <laughs> uh, watching those videos, 
made me a twitter sister fan you know we're not gonna take it and i wanna i wanna rock and then uh i went back and appreciate much of, of of their appreciated a lot of their early music like under the blade and uh yeah, the kid what, what's the name of that one they always started started with um what you don't know sure can hurt you and and all this kind of stuff they have a lot of great records and i was blessed to see them live a few times here in sweden so twisted sister stay hungry 84 i don't know about you guys but that record still to me is one of um, one of my favorites so i really and i really like the re-recording they did in 04 i think still hungry that's pretty cool as well um julian fantasy fantasy yeah, gr gr again, this is an English memory of uh, my mom telling me stories in bed um, to, to help me fall asleep. And uh, she read as The Hobbit mm -hmm. and Lord of the Rings, which was my introduction to many nightmares and also <laughs> the fantasy genre, which I just to this day... Um, if i find something that's good then i'm all in with the series and hopefully there is a series about it it's followed me through my life it, there haven't been that many discoveries of things that have really captured my imagination um terry pratchett followed um and the disc world if you have not experienced uh terry pratchett or you don't know who he is find his first book the color of magic and give it a read you'll be introduced to rincewind the untalented wizard um and then that drove me into fantasy david gemmel writes a lot of heroic fantasy Druce the barbarian great stuff just uh and stephen r donaldson uh the chronicles of thomas covenant um so the fan the fantasy genre when it is good and a lot of these have not been translated into film um, and when they have been translated into film by Peter Jackson, he's completely fucking ruined the stories by changing <laughs> the plot lines and changing the character's head uh, voices, which I have heard in my head since mm -hmm. 1976. So I have it right up here and he ruined them. Um, but you haven't seen a Discworld, I don't think, um, movie, thank God, because Hollywood ruins everything. Um, that's it. Next. Lonnie. Um, you get you mentioned Stay Hungry, which is very yeah. good, but um, for me, it's not Appetite for Destruction. I'm going with the Use Your Illusion albums, mm -hmm. actually. Um, um, Appetite for Destruction was my brother's Guns N' Roses, my older brother's Guns N' Roses, but Use Your Illusion was my Guns N' Roses. Um, I remember, I mean. You know, you, you always hear that the more you, your parents hate something, the more you you love it. And growing up in St. Louis, you know, Axl Rose jumps off stage and punches a fan. And it, <laughs> it made me love them even more. You know of what I course. mean? Because my mom and dad were so disgusted by them and how terrible. Your mom were. seems to be a kind my of. My mom's a, a theme in, in a lot of my growing up. Um, <laughs> My, my wife often says it's amazing you have a relationship with her but <laughs> <laughs> they, but um i the the september 17th 1991 user illusion one and two came out and i mean i, I can still recite the date because i looked forward to it for so long when when it was announced that they were finally going to come out and um it was a tuesday you know, music used to come out on tuesdays obviously and the deal was well you can't go buy those albums until your homework's done. So, I mean, like all day, I'm like sneaking in a math problem in between classes or, or whatever, just so I can make sure I get my homework done on time so I can go buy those albums. And, and I did. And, and they're, they're so great in my opinion. They're, they're just as good as appetite is. Cause like I guess it's my guns and that's my guns and roses is, is use your illusion. Um, I love those albums so freaking much. I mean, as, as much as I love revenge, I love use your illusion um they're, they're i mean it's a it's a big part of who i am are those two albums those albums were just great and guns N' roses by that point in time were like the biggest act in in the world in the even world. though we're here yeah they were huge 
popular well, in St. Louis too, weren't they? They were. They, they, <laughs> they sure set the town on fire. They sure, they sure okay. did. I think and I, was, I see that guy, the guy that he punched. I see him at shows all the time. Okay. <laughs> Go punch, please punch me again. And he is a prick, just so everybody knows. He is a prick. <laughs> okay. Wow. Mark. Okay, so this is a pretty important non-kiss influence for me. And I'm just going to preface this before I, 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 I just humor me. I have to show you just a little 15 second clip of something just so you get the better idea of how this absolutely influenced me. So here I am. I'm about 19 years old at the time, maybe 18. I've been playing guitar for about three years. And, you know, I was enjoying my learning at the time, Black Sabbath and stuff like that, and Metallica. I was learning stuff. And then I went into the guitar store where, you know, the local uh, store where they have all the guitars and drums and stuff like that. And I was talking to one of the store owner guys. And I said, you know, I feel like I'm kind of stuck a little bit with my guitar playing. I go, do you, do you have any like videos or anything like of guitar lessons that might be able to help me out with some of my playing? And he said, Mark, I got just the perfect thing for you. And I brought this tape home and the opening section here i'm going to show i'm not going to play you all of it because it's about a minute and a half long i don't want to take up that much time but just the opening bit here i'm going to show you this one little minute part everybody i know who's bought this video has said the same thing this either makes you inspired to want to learn guitar more better or it'll make you quit playing guitar altogether okay I quit. <laughs> Actually, there's a good difference between that and Vinnie Vincent. Yeah. That makes sense. Jeez, it's fast. <laughs> yeah, so basically, that's Paul Gilbert, as it said there in the beginning. When I saw that, what what happened next was me going into my bedroom for six hours a day, every day for about nine months, mm. going through all these little sequences and tricks and stuff that I showed you, and it really, really took my guitar playing from like pentatonic little riffs here and there to lead playing where I felt that I could pretty much play anything on the guitar afterwards that I was asked to play, whether for my friends or in my mind or whatever. And I have to say, and I've, and I've written to Paul myself personally on his, on his uh, Facebook page and a couple of other spots. Oh, and I've actually thanked him for that video. And uh, it, it, it was just absolutely life changing for me. So if anybody's out there who's interested in taking their guitar to a next level, that whole lesson video is on YouTube. So I, I would highly, I would highly advise it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, now we're moving on to our final two picks uh, when it comes to Kiss influences and other influences. So I would like you to, you know, like. Um, um pair up both your your interests combine. in one combine yes exactly so uh i'll start off my final two kiss influences are actually strike magazine firehouse magazine you know getting to um, sort of meet other fans writing letters getting answers sort of uh, communicating with other fans because there weren't a lot of KISS fans around me in, in the 90s. So this was a perfect outlet for me to get my views across and getting some, you know, information. And the other one that has meant a lot for me was actually the message boards. Uh, sort of the same vein, you know, getting meet uh, to meet other fans online. You know, it started somewhere around 96, maybe when, when the internet really took off. And I started off on the Kiss Asylum message board. I'm sure a lot of you guys were there as well. 
And then it went on to the KISS FAQ message board, which was really important. So uh, uh, the fan, the fan scenes and the message boards were a way to to stay in contact with other KISS fans. When, when I didn't see anyone around where I lived, there were none. So it was really important to, to keep the interest and see that other people appreciated the music and uh, that there were more fans than myself because at times it felt like, you know, in the 90s, I was all alone. Was there any other fans? And the, the fan scenes and the message boards sort of saved my interest and, and made me feel that, well, there are other guys around that get this, you know other people know that this is good stuff so so the fan scenes and the message boards were really important and to this day i, I go to the kiss have q message board, board of course and uh check it out lonnie um it's good because my my final two kiss ones kind of coincide with each other and that is seeing the band live finally for the first time uh when they came through here um july 2nd 1996 and just being blown away by seeing, you know, kind of like what Mark said when he got to see him in 96. Um, just being blown away by seeing the original four in makeup, in those Love Gun costumes, playing all that 70s classic Kiss material um, with the levitating drum set, the smoking guitar, the, the guitar that shot rockets, Gene flying up in the rafters. Just the whole experience of seeing a true Kiss show in makeup um, really again, propelled my KISS fandom yet again. And then telling my friends about it and them looking at me like, oh, KISS, that's, you know, they're old, they're doing it for the money. This is, and, and, and they may well have been doing it for the money when you come out of this KISS. <laughs> but uh, but they're, they're, it, it, this is 1996 and my friends are telling me that KISS is old and I mean, well, KISS is still touring today. But, yeah. um, you know, they're like, oh, that's stupid. That's, you know, and but then they were on MTV Video Music Awards, and that's when back when MTV Video Music Awards was an event, and everybody watched it, and they closed out the show, and then coming to school the next day, my friends looking at me and like, um, yeah, that's pretty freaking cool. Um, it was it was um, vindication uh, of what I had been telling people how how great this band is and then them on that national audience in front of the Brooklyn bridge. And one of their better performances of the reunion era is, is that Brooklyn bridge performance and everybody seeing that the next day saying, yeah, that's, that's pretty freaking cool. I, I get where you're coming from on this whole kiss thing. So those two events, seeing them live and then seeing them, you know, on a, on a national scale and getting the vindication of that they were back and they were as big as I was telling everyone. Yeah, that vindication was real cool to have. Uh, Mark? Okay, so I'll make these two quick. Uh, so the number one has got to be Creatures of the Night. Uh, Creatures of the Night was one of the last couple of records that I got into from Kiss. Uh, the last two being The Elder and the very last one being Unmasked. Uh, but when I first heard Creatures of the Night, uh, it was a complete eye-opener for me. And it's a record that I still listen to quite frequently and it's a record that still inspires me very much in my own music mm -hmm. but not as so much as far as songwriting but as far as sonics go to, just to make a record that sounds that heavy and that punchy and how they got those drums and all that i mean I, that's one of the things i remember reading in immense detail in these books that we talk about right how did it how did they get these sounds and stuff like that you know it, it's just just a fantastic album and one that's very important in my kiss you know, influence. And the other thing that has to be said that's been that was extremely important to me were the KISS conventions of the 90s, especially here in Toronto, when they started having these KISS conventions. Uh, I would Ted would take me, we would go down there to Toronto and just to see these conventions that they would have here. Uh, and this is before the Gene and Paul run one. This is like the independent ones that were happening here. We would find all kinds of VHS copies of shows. I mean, that's where I got my first copies of Cobo Hall, Winterland, uh, you know, the, the Creatures compilations. And I even got myself a, a VHS copy of my reunion show that I saw in 96 on VHS at these conventions. So they were extremely important 
uh, that way too. And it was also one of the few first places where I saw people, you know, exchanging vinyl and stuff like that. This is long before the vinyl phase, you know what I mean? Uh, started this is in the nineties. Nobody was really talking about vinyl then, but, th but back in those conventions, people were bringing their records and selling them and trading with people. So the kiss conventions were great for that. And, and there were great for another thing that Daniel always brings up is meeting other kiss fans. And like-minded people that was they were that was one of the greatest things that you could do and of course they always had one or two uh interesting kiss tribute bands that you could check out at the time some of them were good some of them were okay uh but it was fun to see those as well because you know the ones that were good were fun to watch because it was like you know imagining how you know kiss in the early days almost because they were you know not as good as kiss but they they were getting there you know what i mean so the conventions the conventions were really fun to go to Oh, that's true. Ken? Yeah, for the final couple, um, one would be a year later than the last one I talked about, uh, about 79, when that event, uh, putting on the makeup on Halloween and then you know going out and about with my three buddies who all had the makeup on, you know, different characters. Um, and then get coming back and you know after that late at night and watching the tomorrow show with tom snyder and watching them on there and that's that's kind of the first time seeing them in that kind of uh interview type uh, mode and that crazy uh <laughs> crazy show that we you know it's, you laugh about it now it's, it was but it was you know it was, it was great it was good so that was one thing the other is um, really a, a number of the concerts, especially the events of the first time going to see them in 79 at the Cal Palace in San Francisco. And then yeah. the other big event, of course, was, you know, it was, it was, that's like the first time seeing them. But then seeing them in Creatures, but four years later, it was like, almost like seeing them again for the first time again. Um, because it had been such a long time in between. Uh, that was such a long break. Um, and then being able to see that happen, and that was just, you know, fantastic. Um, and then just going to then, you know, later in the, in the road tour, you know, being in the front row with Julian in Oakland, I mean, that that was that was just a fantastic show. And, and I enjoyed it. And like you said, being with you know like-minded uh, people, definitely Julian and I are pretty like-minded um, for a lot of things. But uh, definitely Kiss. So that was a you know just a great night and a great show and one you know one of the my favorite uh, shows of of Kiss you know of all time, even going back to the early stuff. That's kind of cool that you enjoy that show that much uh, when they were so it's close. Fantastic. To yeah, it's fantastic. It's experience. Uh, it really make me happy yeah. to hear. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Julian, can you uh, take things out here with your two final picks when it comes? Yeah, to just interviews? just to echo Ken, but that show was just something else. I mean, that was just like a perfect confluence in the moments, going nuts front row, um, great people around us great soundtrack getting to take ken backstage was yeah. just to, to be able to <laughs> play it forward like someone had done for me in the past it was great all right my last two picks kiss alive forever yeah that's it, cool. it, it remains a, a gold standard for a lot of people um the original era touring history and it served as an inspiration to me because this has a hell of a lot of data it's what it didn't say that inspired me to go and do the on tour series in a whole different way to see what was being said locally about these shows and to fill in the gaps and to add to what they had started on but without this there wouldn't be that so kiss alive forever and the work that those authors did you know has uh, again it continues to serve as an inspiration as even this week i've managed to cancel another show from the 70s did not take place so it's a never ending <laughs> process um and tied in with that is the live experience my first show psycho circus was the first mm -hmm. time i saw the band um just because of happenstance and everything that happened in my life that had made it not happen until that moment so i got to see the originals 
may have not been a live worldwide, but I still got to see the original four as my first live Kiss experience. Uh, but it inspired me because I'd seen other concerts, but I'd never experienced the camaraderie that comes at going to a Kiss concert and bumping into those like-minded fans. And a lot of people are bumping into people that they didn't see since the previous Kiss concert. And that's where it really comes home, that the KISS community is an incredibly special community, that there are these bonds that transcend space and time. You may only see each other in person when you go to KISS concerts. Now, there are a lot of people who had just seen people a week before some other heavy metal concert. But again, it really is. It wasn't a community that I experienced seeing Dave Lee Roth or Tesla or the Steve Miller band. There weren't a bunch of Steve Miller fans outside. Hey, man, great to see you since the last. You know, it wasn't the same at all the other rock shows that I had seen like it is and remains at a Kiss concert because it was the same when Ken and I were at that March 2020 show that I saw people who I hadn't seen since the previous KISS show, mm -hmm. um, still the same to this day. And I expect it to be like that at the Hollywood Bowl when I see them in a couple mm -hmm. of weeks and at Madison Square Garden when I see them in a couple of months. So the live experience is about the human experience. Yeah, that's some real interesting comments, Julian. And if you look behind uh, Ken, you see a big sign that says KISS Army. And Kiss Army is something special. I mean, it's close. I've never been a religious guy, but it's the closest thing I've ever been to religion. You know, <laughs> there's something that uh, you know we all feel the same thing. We all kind of like the same stuff, and it's really interesting to to be a part of. And uh, especially as, as Julian said, you experience it when you're when you're at a live concert, it's just magic. Well, I've said um, that it's like receiving electric communion in the electric cathedral. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to the final two picks when it comes to other influences. And I just have to mention Seinfeld. <laughs> Such a great show. Uh, I don't know if anyone else likes Seinfeld. I love Seinfeld. Seinfeld. That's a good, great show. Favorite show of all time. I don't know how many times I've watched the episodes i mean at least 10 times every episode and um, it was a great way for me to you know learn a bit of um, you know english or american expressions uh that was the good part but, but other than that it was just so fun it was just so fun so funny and uh so i've been a seinfeld fan since then i'm i remember being a bit sad when they ended in, I think it, they ended somewhere around 98 or something like that. So, mm -hmm. but even after that, I've rewatched the episodes over and over again. I turned on my girlfriend to sign for, so we've watched them together as well. Uh, let's see if I can make my kids watch Seinfeld. I'm not so sure about that, but I'll try at least. And the other thing that really influenced me were the american war movies of the mm. you know, late 80s like uh, the platoon mm. and full oh, metal yeah. jacket yeah i really enjoyed those anti-war movies and uh, it actually made me uh, a sniper in, when i did my military service <laughs> so I, did, I don't know if i got the anti-war <laughs> message real that so i was a sniper for 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 a year there i wasn't that good so i, I didn't I, I became a teacher later on but at least i've tried it and uh uh i but those m movies has they have really stand stood the test of time i i also rewatched them with my oldest daughter and she mm -hmm. really enjoyed them and uh i think there are great pieces of work you know some of the greatest films in film history and um if you haven't watched the platoon or full metal jacket you just go and do that right now but let's hear what lana has to say about his last two other influences on his life well my last two are very different from one another um the first one is going to be alice cooper um again like kiss very visually exciting um I, I love Alice's music. It's just fun. And I know it's supposed to be dark, but in my mind, it's also just lighthearted. Like Alice, um, it, it's, it's dark, but lighthearted at the same time. And it's not supposed to be taken too seriously. And Alice puts on a great show. And like, 
I, I'd seen Alice in 96. He came through with, with Scorpions, which was a really cool show to see. And then he came through in 2004. I was really at a, at a crossroads in a bad part of my life. And he came through, um, played a, a, a medium sized theater, maybe a small theater, you could call it. And a friend of mine gave me free tickets to go see it. And it's like, I had nothing else to do that night. And I went by myself and it, you know, it was just great. It just put me in a great mood and put me in a good spot. And, um, I still thank Alice for that night. Cause it was, you know, it was, like I said, it was a low part of my life and you know, that Alice came through and just kind of, you know, put me in a, just a better place. Um, and I, and did, I've seen Alice so many times since then, because be, probably because of that night, like, I, I just really made me a big Alice. I liked Alice, but it made me a big Alice fan. And then the other one, I really can't pick a moment to it or anything like that, but, um, Growing up in St. Louis and um, growing up with my dad, he made me such a big Cardinal baseball fan. Um, I've seen so many Cardinal games with my dad. And my dad is just like a wealth of knowledge when it comes to Cardinal baseball. And it's 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 just this common bond that him and I have together. Like every day, I during the season, I talk to him every morning driving into work. And we talk about the game the night before, no matter how good they are, no matter how bad they are. And still to this day, he's almost 80 years old. And I talk to him every day on my way to work during the season. And we talk about Cardinal baseball, talk about the game before, and, you know, how he thinks the manager should be fired or, 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 or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that, that's a, that's a big part of who I am. And it's because of him. Nice to hear that both you and Mark mentioned your fa fathers. Um, they seem to have made some some sort of mark on your life, so that's kind of cool. Uh, let's move on to Mark. Okay, well, the last two are pretty significant, but I'll make them quick. Uh, the first one is the band Rush. I'll say it before I say it again. They were the reason why I got into music, period. I mean, when I was very young, I stumbled into my sister's room, put on her, grabbed her headphones, turned on her stereo, and on the turntable was Rush, Rush Exit Stage Left. And th I'll never forget hearing that record. It changed everything for me as far as music and my interest in it. Uh, to, to see that it was just three people making that much sound was something that just never, I could never understand for a while when being that young. But you know, it got me very interested in music. And the minute that I found my my sister's guitar, it was just something that became an obsession in my life and has to this point still been a huge obsession in my life. As you can see behind me, keyboards, guitars everywhere behind me. There's all kinds of music stuff, CDs and albums and pictures of stuff. And, you know, mu music is it has encapsulated my life completely. So, uh, and, you know, there's many people to thank for that, but Russia has a big part to play in that. And the other thing that was, uh, it was mentioned once already here by one of you guys, I think it was Julian, but uh, Star Trek The Next Generation was a very big television show for me here. Uh, back in the day, my my father and, uh, you know, he, he used to watch Star Trek, the original episode, but it was very funny watching him do it. And I never understood as how funny it was watching him watch it because him being so scientifically, you know, encapsulated in his life. A lot of the times I would hear him like grumbling, like that's not possible. That's not scientifically, but like whenever he watched the original, <laughs> like what are they talking about? You know, but he, he found the next generation much more interesting. And it was a show that we would watch together more because like, you know, was said later, the oldest touch screen technology and all this stuff that they show on, TV, like oh, during those episodes, were things that became part of real life now, too, right? I mean, even some of the stuff in the original series was later on done, like the, you know, the tricorder became like the flip phone, right? Uh, but th that television show was pretty important for that reason. It was one of the only television shows in this house that I could watch with my father. My mom loves that show. Even my sisters, who are not big into any kind of scientific stuff, it, it, the next generation had something about it that had something for everybody I found. Whereas the original one was very specific, I found, to a certain type of person, you know? Whereas the next generation, you could have the whole family watch and somebody would have found something that they like in it, whether it's Data, whether it's Jordy, 
whether it's you know Picard. Everybody in my family. Don't forget had Wolf. Favorites. I mean, Wolf. Yeah, Wolf. Yeah, Mr. Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, that's the thing that that was great about it is that everybody in my family had their favorites, and that's what made that show so fantastic. And it was a huge thing in my life. And I know, thank God, it ran so long because it, it gave us many hours of, you know, entertainment throughout the years. Nice to hear that both your father and your sister had such a positive influence on your life you need, yeah. really need to cherish that okay ken what about you yeah um i guess one is kind of two-pronged is is uh batman yeah uh, wait, wait, definitely wait. batman and comic books um and that kind of you know i think that a lot of road led to kiss you know in a way too that helped yeah. me you know that that Part of Kiss where they were like superheroes. Um, mm. So, but Batman, the 1966 series, uh, you know, I watched when it first was on TV when I was a little kid. I was like five years old, and when it first appeared, I thought it was real. I thought it was real stuff. But did, did you get that it was comedy, or, or did you? Not really. No, no, no. no. not until later when the, you know no. you saw the reruns later, and I was older. As like I, you, you got all the, you know, the puns and the. And everything the comedy that part of it um i you know when you're a little kid like they think it is so serious um yeah it taught <clears throat> taught me you know about, about you know good versus evil and and being a good being good is is you know right the right thing to do being a good person being following That's the right. laws and and doing that stuff you know um good is over evil um and I watched a lot of John Wayne movies back then too. You know, I was like, "Always What's the good your favorite, guy." Your favorite John Wayne movie, The Searchers. Well, that was, yeah, that was a good movie. Um, I don't know. There's there's a lot um, <laughs> I like of John Wayne movies, but I can't pick one right now. But uh, oh, yeah. so so the Batman and, and the comic book superhero that sort of thing. Okay, and then the other um, is our our musicals. Um, even back in the day, I would watch the musicals like West Side Story. The, the music of West, you know, it was in West Side Story. And there's, an, there's another thing there is a lot of those movies were, you know, that was good for Steve or not good, but there was, you know, two gangs and, and that sort of thing um, in that one. But the music of that, Leonard Bernstein, you know, all that stuff kind of led me down the road to that other, you know, more music. Uh, being uh, open to other music, you know, Oklahoma is another movie I, I've always loved, and and then going back to the old musicals like with Gene Kelly, you know, Singing in the Rain, and a lot of those movies had those interludes or uh, open parts where they played the uh, orchestra and the music, kind of a a mixture of what's to come, or they'd have the intermission part in the way back in the day they used to have an intermission in in movies back then there would be intermission and then they'd play more music um and stuff like that but the, to break up the movie but the the music you know led me down to being open to a lot of music different types of music um you know that's maybe why i like electric light orchestra a lot because of the, that kind of music that i listened to back then so you know, uh, it's got to be a, have an open mind to the to music, but musicals was a big big deal too. Um, and then just real quick, last thing is that, yeah, I am you know, pretty well everything that made me is you know my mom and my dad, and they were always supportive and always open to whatever I wanted to do. They, they always cool. you know whatever they didn't say no, you can't do that really you know, except and my mom I think told me I can't and not allowed to play football. Um, she thought, okay, I know I played being with sports, but I, even though I played football on the streets, you know, it's like when you say football, football, it's not American football. She didn't want me to play high school football, and oh. that, you know, I played other, you know, I played uh, soccer, play. means American soccer and, and basketball and, de and tennis and golf, yeah, and all that, but whatever. Yeah, he doesn't mean soccer, he means football. No. Yeah. Football, football, both footballs. So um, no one anyway. cares about that. No, I played. Yeah, soccer. I played <laughs> my, soccer. My mom let me play football, but the coach said, "No, you're too small. Go." I got. I got. <laughs> you're just. I you're. Got, you're, yeah. you're a tall guy, Lonnie. I, I was very small as a freshman in high school. Oh, I got cut from a non-cut sport. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh god. Wow. Oh, no. 
Jeez. That's bad. That's so that's, but that's it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that covers everything. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, we all know you're a Batman fan, but you don't have that Batman box be- behind you that you had previously. It's above yeah. there. Actually, okay, I have it's a, somewhere around. I have there, a Batman. Yeah. Batman in that box is a Batman yeah. cowl. For me, Batman. From 1966. Hit, Batman hits hard, but that was in 18, not 18, 1989. When mm-hmm. Michael oh, Keaton did, Keaton. you know, his, his, his oh, yeah, role, that was a big deal that hit hard over here. You know, everyone was into Batman, yeah, in '89. So, and I think he's he's done a part as Batman lately, hasn't he? In some sort of movie, yeah, in the Michael Flash. Keaton, yeah. yeah, he came back. I time. haven't seen that one yet, but we'll see. Okay, we have the two final picks of Julian to go, but, but I have, have to mention briefly the Cardinals. Uh, that Lonnie talked about. I have no idea what that is, but the cardinal, the bird, is a really cool-looking bird. And Beautiful. you know, as an amateur mm-hmm. orno- ornithologist, ornithologist, say, yeah, right. uh, I would really like to see that one, but I have never seen it. So uh, that's what I. Uh, it's a really cool-looking bird. They're beautiful. Uh, we used yeah. to have them on the East Coast. Uh, there were two beautiful birds that would fly into our gardens. Uh, the cardinal, which is red, gorgeous, mm-hmm. and the blue jay, which is yeah, that's a cool too. one. Yeah, I love that. I hear a lot here. We have we have a version of the blue jay over here that we see. They are almost they're almost you know like tame. When you go into the forest, you can you can feed them almost. Uh, just before the show, I I posted a picture for these guys when I was outside and we have gotten the first snow, and I was on a hike. So you know I'm I'm really into hiking in nature. So. I actually got to see the biggest um, woodpecker that we have in Sweden today, and I also saw the the smallest owl. I heard it. You know, I I have learned the 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 way they sound. So that's something that you d- might not have known that I'm an amateur. Uh, and how do you say it? Or no. Or not pathologist. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so let's move on to Julian's two final picks. Well. The Beatles is yeah. going to be the first one. It's central to my musical life because my tape box circa 1980 was Magical Mystery Tour, Rubber Soul. I think Sergeant Peppers was in there. Um, John Lennon, Shave Fish. Mm-hmm. Um, and imagine, that was my music for many years. My mom's from Liverpool. Sister was born there. Family lived in Southport, so close to Liverpool. So went to a lot of the pubs where the Beatles played. It's uh, central to my musical essence to the point where I didn't listen to the Rolling Stones for many years because I was a Beatles fan. Not supposed to listen to the Rolling Stones. They're the enemy of those Londoners. (laughs) Um, You know, I still have a very negative opinion of London, even though I was born there. Go figure. Mm. Um, So the, the Beatles. And to this day, I will buy any Beatles box set. I will buy any new Beatles release. Um, without thinking. I'm glad I did become a fan of the Rolling Stones. I think I was missing out on a lot of good good music. The other thing is history. My degree at university was in, well, in history. And I've always had an interest in just history. I watched nothing but documentaries, basically. I don't watch sitcoms. I don't watch fucking Seinfeld. Well, are um, you crazy, man? <laughs> I, 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 that stuff, I just does not you know, hold me these days. Um, I've just found another series on Egyptology, which yeah, I'm just cool watched well. that every single night. You know, I'll watch stuff about, you know, revisiting World War II, the sinking of the Bismarck, you know, Hitler's mm-hmm. assassination. I don't fucking care. Uh, Mayan history, Aztec history, um, Southeast Asian history, Aboriginal history. I love history. I just want to watch mm-hmm. documentaries. So, you know, it's not surprising that I'm really into digging into a band's history um, mm. where yeah. it's always been. I sucked at science and math. I was always good at social studies and history in school because I was interested in it. I, you know, still can't add. Um, I, 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 But I like history documentaries with a science basis, you know, like the deepest, the farthest, you know, the Voyager shit. So... All of that is what is important to me. I actually uh, just wanted to mention history because it ties in nicely with what I do on a daily basis. 
whereas my original second pick was going to be Monty Python because everyone needs a fucking <laughs> yeah. laugh in their life. <laughs> right. Life of Brian. Yeah. Well, thank you, Julian. Uh, and that's about it. Now we've gone through all our cultural influences when it comes to Kiss and other influences. And it was real nice to hear you guys. You were went kind of personal. And we now know that we have some sophisticated people on the show, like Ken, who likes complicated music, and Julian, who likes history. He never watches Seinfeld. Uh, he's so sophisticated. Okay. Uh, so... My question to you guys listening, what are your popular cultural references? The, the thing I'm kind of interested in to, to, to get to know is, is, are there any common denominators? Are there a lot of KISS fans that like Star Wars or history or, you know, whatever that we liked? We'll see. So please chime in with your comments. And, uh, you know, soon show number 500 is coming up 500 you wow. guys wow yeah. and julian has been on 400 something and ken has been on 400 something and lonnie and mark is right behind there so they've done a lot of shows what i would like to know is what would you like to see for show 500 we do need to do something special so do you have any suggestions or wishes about what we should do Please write it in the comment. But uh, you know what we should do is do a live show and live give show. out give out the link to people to hop on who've been watching us for a long time and have them. Yeah, that, have yeah them they can on. pop on. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I'm sure the the viewers yeah. have have more suggestions. So maybe topics, maybe something we should speak about, or the history of the show, or something because we we're closing in on ten years. You know, you guys, <laughs> we've almost wow. done this for ten years uh mind boggling <laughs> okay yeah so i guess that's about it so from julian lonnie ken mark and myself daniel see you next time peace out thank you for spending time listening to the kiss faq podcast today all sales are final there are no refunds if you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.